Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth on Now You Know. Sponsored this week by A Better Root Planner. Hey, there's a new feature, right? That's right. A Better Root Planner makes finding chargers an intuitive experience. When you're zoomed out, the highest power charging stations are displayed. When you zoom in, more lower power charging stations appear, helping you find the best charger on your way. Another feature, making this a better root planner. That's cool. We're also brought to you by ecoware.us. You can buy one of these awesome t-shirts and have it be completely carbon neutral because we carbon neutralize it and then we plant a tree on top of that, so it becomes carbon negative. We've got t-shirts, sweatshirts, towels, all sorts of cool things. So go to ecoware.us and check it out. And it helps support us here on the show. So we're just wrapping up a big week here on serious climate discussions throughout the world, right? Big strikes, demonstrations, over 4 million people protesting in the streets and demanding that our governments and corporations change. We've reported on Tesla Time News about Greta Thunberg and all the students participating around the world. But keep in mind that the fossil fuel industry has been busy as well. Yeah, they have to keep finding ways to maintain the status quo, which is pumping fossil fuels out of the ground to keep the gravy train going. And what does this look like? Well, we got a rare glimpse of it this week. At this week's climate summit meetings at the UN in New York, nine of the most powerful fossil fuel company CEOs met in one room and came up with their plan. And they took questions from reporters and activists to explain it. They call themselves the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, which was formed in 2014. It's a group of oil and gas companies, including BP, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Royal Dutch Shell, and Total. Their mission is essentially to spin what they're doing in their industry so that they can keep pumping oil and gas out of the ground and sell it to people who will burn it but to make it sound like they're a part of the solution. So one of the first quotes from this conference came from Eldar Satre. He's the CEO of Equinor. Flaring is one of the biggest issues, as it's a waste and bad for the industry's reputation. We can do something about it. All right, so let's just, let's just translate that for a second. Basically, flaring is the most obvious bad thing that they do. So if they stop flaring, most people will stop caring. Flaring is a great visual to how much waste the oil and gas industry creates, as you can see here, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. OGCI are hoping that by reducing this very visual component that the public will lose interest. Right. And this is just one of the, the smaller statements that, that came out of this conference. The next one comes from Ben Van Buren, the CEO of Royal Dutch Shell. Ultimately, the Paris Agreement on Climate is going to be met. In the end, it is the responsibility of industry, companies like us, to make sure that the transition is going to be as orderly as possible and not going to be disruptive. Natural gas could be a part of the solution. All right, so let's translate this. Mm -hmm. The first sentence is basically an outright lie. Right. Um, they don't know whether the... Paris Climate Accord is going to be met. And they not. don't care. And they don't care. He said it's the responsibility of industry to make sure that the transition is going to be orderly as possible and not going to be disruptive. That basically just means we want to stay in control. We want to make sure that whatever happens, we know it's going to happen. Right. Let's not get the government involved because they will start taxing us or making things illegal. And let's offer a solution that sounds good. Natural gas could be part of the solution. Right. Natural gas. We make natural gas. And it's natural. And you can have some of it. Right. So, I mean, this is kind of like if we were on a sinking ship, mm -hmm. right? And um, we're trying to come up with a solution quickly to keep the ship from sinking. And the only solutions being offered are... Right. So the ship is sinking. Don't worry, stay seated, relax, drink your tea, we'll take care of everything. Oh, and we have a solution. We have some drills. Everyone take a drill. Drill for you. Drill for you. Yes, now everyone start drilling small holes in the hull. That will help relieve all the water that's in the hull. It will leach out and the boat will right itself. So let's talk about this whole natural gas solution. A big selling point for natural gas is that it produces 50% less CO2 than coal when burned in a new power plant. Yay! The majority of people think that natural gas is clean, that it somehow leaves nothing when you burn it. Uh huh. Uh, what they don't tell you is that natural gas is primarily methane, which still produces CO2 when it's burned. Uh huh. It's a fossil fuel. Right. It is 34 times stronger than CO2 at trapping heat over a 100-year period and 86 times stronger over 20 years. And natural gas can contain toxic gases like radon, benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, 
and xylene. Not so natural. So what? I, I mean, I get that it produces CO2 when it's burned, but it's less than coal. So if we switch to natural gas, we'd be cutting the greenhouse gas emissions by 50%, right? We aren't just burning it. What? What else are we doing with it? We're leaking it. We're leaking it? According to Lena Moffitt, director of Stop Dirty Fuels campaign at the Sierra Club, oil and gas companies don't have to comply with the Clean Air Act or the Safe Water Drinking Act or the Clean Water Act when building their pipelines. And so natural gas is actually worse for the environment than coal. Wait, I don't get it. How could it be worse than coal? Well, according to a 2018 paper in Science, greenhouse gas methane leakage from U.S. oil and natural gas supply chains is 60% higher than the EPA estimates. That's 2.3% of gross U.S. gas production is leaked into the air. And this study only surveyed leaks at oil and gas facilities. Right. That leads right into what Mike Worth said at the OGCI meeting. Very soon, nobody is going to be able to hide from methane leakage because of satellites and other detection technologies. So, so let's translate that for a second. Uh, we know that we are leaking more natural gas into the atmosphere than we should, and we're about to get caught. Like, yeah. we were able to hide it before. We were able to say, oh, we were just leaking just a little bit. Oh, it's just leaking a little bit. But now that we have satellites, like the methane sat, um, we're going to be able to detect methane leaks all around the world. Yeah, and we're starting to see a bigger picture of way higher leakage rates of methane. I mean, how could this be? Why would there be leaks at all? I mean, it's valuable, right? Like, you can sell it to someone and they'll pay you money for it. So why would you just leak it? Well, let's take right here in Massachusetts, for example. Uh, some of the natural gas pipes being used in Boston were installed back in the late 1800s, and they're still being used today. Now, these pipes, a lot of them made, made of clay uh, with leather seals, which have all dried up or disintegrated. Um, and if you check out this map here of data in Boston of gas leaks from 2018, quite astounding at the number of gas leaks just in the city of Boston. So it's just in Massachusetts because we have this archaic system because we're an old city or something? Uh, nope, it's everywhere. Take a look at this map. So I guess what I don't understand is, is it, again, it's valuable. Why would you just be leaking it out into the world? Well, because digging up gas mains and replacing them with new ones costs money. And it's cheaper for them to lose 3 to 9% of their gas than it is to fix all of them. Okay, but I mean, isn't, isn't it flammable? Doesn't it explode? Oh, yeah. All the time. You remember last year when 40 homes here in Lawrence and Andover blew up, killing one person and forcing 30,000 people to evacuate their houses? Basically, it just sounded like the entire town blew up. Yeah, I mean, on average in the U.S., 11 people die from gas explosions every year. Okay, so I get that it's expensive to fix all of the gas leaks, and so that's why they keep them. And if the, if the gas doesn't explode, that's good because it doesn't kill anybody, right? So, I mean, that's kind of where we are. Right? Yeah, I mean, so let's reiterate, right? Natural gas is leaking from facilities and pipelines all over the world at a rate much higher than previously estimated. We're talking anywhere from three to 9% of all gas production is leaking into the atmosphere and natural gas is primarily methane. And as we said before, methane is 34 times stronger than CO2 at trapping heat over a 100 year period and 86 times stronger over 20 years. So if I had a balloon full of CO2 and a balloon full of methane mm -hmm. and I popped both of them, mm -hmm. the balloon full of methane would trap 86 times more heat in the atmosphere than the balloon full of CO2 over just 20 years. Yep. And over 100 years, it would trap 34 times more heat in the atmosphere. Yep, it's way worse than CO2. And so the climate crisis, we're talking about scales of 20 to 100 years. Right. This is not, we're not talking about like, oh, in a thousand years, we're in trouble. Right. We're talking, these are the time scales. Exactly. So if methane is so much more potent than CO2, you don't have to leak that much of it into the air to make it worse Exactly. Then coal. So that number is 3% of total production, and we're already over that percentage. That means that natural gas is worse than coal. In terms of CO2 pollution. Yeah. So actually, natural gas is not a solution for climate change. It's not a tr good transition to renewables. It's actually causing global warming. Exactly. More than coal. Exactly. Which is a crazy thing to say and it's not because of the burning it right on paper everything looks great right but then when you actually go out into the real world and you start realizing that methane is a gas and it's hard to contain gases right and that you have to you know transport it thousands of miles right. through pipelines 
and that it leaks, it's worse. You got it. And these CEOs are sitting here and telling us that we should switch to natural gas. Yep, because they make it. Let's go on to Patrick Poyan. He's the CEO of Total. The only question is the pace at which society, not only us, society, will accept to make this transformation. Okay, let's translate that. Uh, what he's basically saying is that if society wants fast change, they'll get it. And so the subtext to that is all they have to do is convince society that a few decades is fast enough and they will be rich and they will die on a fancy yacht. Exactly. Right? Because if we want fast change, if we were to all call our lawmakers and vote people into office who actually give a hoot about climate change, the change would happen almost immediately because yep. laws can do that. Exactly. So then Vicky Holub, the CEO of Occidental Petroleum, said, Carbon capture, utilization, and storage technology is there, but has to be exploited on a broad scale. Occidental wants to build the world's largest atmosphere carbon capture plant in the Permian Basin. When it comes to acting on climate change, failure is not an option. And let's translate that one. By making this plant... We can fool people into thinking that we have a cure for climate change. You know, because what is atmospheric carbon capture? Yeah, atmospheric carbon capture is a process, and everyone gets really excited by this, whereby CO2 is filtered out of the air, and then the filters are heated to 100 degrees Celsius, and then the CO2 is collected. Right, so you have this box, you're flowing air through the, the filter, mm -hmm. it collects CO2, then you close up the box, you heat it up so all the CO2 comes off, and then you can, you can collect it and put it in a bottle. Yep, sounds great, right? That's great. But wait, uh -huh. you have to build these filters mm -hmm. and the CO2 collection plant. Mm -hmm. You have to power it with clean energy or else you've just wasted your time because if you burned oil and gas to power it, that would be not carbon neutral yep. anymore. And then you have to do something with the CO2. Now, the proposal you just heard from Vicky at Occidental is to ship that compressed CO2 gas to an oil field and pump it into the ground. Sweet, awesome. No, I'm what? not finished. Oh, okay. You pump it into the ground to pump out the last remaining drops of oil that were not easily coming out. Okay, well, I mean, you're sequestering CO2. I guess you're getting a little bit of oil out, right? Just a just a little, you know, you said the last little drops, right? Well, it's about 15% of the oil field. Uh, it's that last remaining part that's very hard for them to get out without putting something into the ground to push it out. Okay, so you're as you're pumping in the CO2, you're pumping out just about the same amount of oil. Right. Okay, but I mean, it's at least it's still stuck underground. Well, what happens when you blow up a balloon? Uh, you have a party? Okay, well, what happens after the party to the balloon? Uh, it, it shrinks, generally. Right. The CO2 escapes back into the atmosphere. Okay, but I mean, this is, we're talking underground, not in a balloon. Right. Uh, it's a gas. You just pumped it into the ground. You think it's just going to stay there forever? But I mean, this, this can't be right. I mean, the, the U.S. government gives oil companies a federal tax credit of $35 per ton for doing this. So it must be good. There have been no long-term studies to show what happens to the CO2 pumped underground. So we have no idea if it stays there and if it does for how long. And even if it stays there for, let's say, 20 years, that's still not going to help. And do you see the problem here? Mm -hmm. The oil lobby is so strong that they got a federal tax credit, a subsidy, our tax money to help them pump more oil while looking like good guys, but there's no science to back it up. But I mean, look at those carbon capture facilities. They must be sucking out so much carbon out of the air. And maybe you can just, I don't know, put it in a, a big tank. Well, let's take a look. This facility by Climeworks in Switzerland has 18 carbon capture devices and it captures 900 tons of CO2 a year. Wow. 900 tons of CO2 well, a year. Hold on. Yeah? That's about what 150 ice cars produce in a year in CO2 emissions. So to offset the entire planet's car fleet, we would need 6.7 million of these facilities. Because there's a billion cars. There's a billion cars. Oh, and keep in mind that you have to power each of these units with renewable energy. Like we said, wind and solar, or else you aren't doing any carbon neutral. Okay. Um, and you have to build and maintain and staff those plants. So it costs Climeworks between three and four million dollars per plant. So just to remove the CO2 created by the world's cars, you would need to spend, ready for this? Mm -hmm. 
23.4 trillion dollars. Trillion. Trillion. With a with a T. 23.4 trillion dollars. Even if you could scale up and reduce costs by say 50%, that would still cost over 11 trillion dollars. And keep in mind that's just for the physical plants, not including the energy or the staff. And that's just to offset the cars in the world, which is only about 18% of the carbon problem. So, I mean, to offset the whole world's carbon, we're talking well over a hundred trillion dollars. If you want to do this solution, like Vicky said, a hundred trillion, I mean, and that's just probably the beginning. This is crazy. I mean, that's ludicrous. What kind of a mad person would think that this is a viable solution? Uh, OGCI, the fossil fuel industry. I mean, let's go back to our sinking ship analogy, okay. right? It's like, you're on the sinking ship and you're mm -hmm. like, there, we're on a sinking ship. There's a problem. We need to fix this. And 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 they went, oh, oh do not worry, for we are fixing the problem. There, oh, hooray. Yes, there is a magic pump. A magic pump? Yes, and it is going to be pumping the water out of the boat back into the ocean. Magic pump? Absolutely, yes. It's we're a magic pump. Pumps all of the water I, out of the boat back into the ocean. I would like to see this magic pump. Oh, do well. It, you, it's it's here. It's behind the door. You can't see it. I think I should see it. It's no, very important no, that I know not, what's going on. No, 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 no. It's it's wonderful. I demand to see it. That's not a magic pump. That's just a man with a teacup throwing water against the wall. There has to be a better way of sequestering carbon than to you know suck it out of the air, concentrate it, pressurize it. Shoot it underground so just so you can get more oil out. I mean, there has to be a better solution. Yeah, I mean, first part of the solution is uh -huh. to stop emitting CO2. Let's take a look here at Tesla's website. To put this in perspective, Tesla drivers have already saved 3.5 million tons of CO2 by driving electric cars. I mean, wow. Okay. That I mean, that's just less work for you to do. Exactly. So, I mean, the first thing is to start converting all of our fossil fuel burning machines to electric clean machines. Right, that are powered by renewable energy, solar and wind. So now, the next step is instead of building thousands of carbon capture facilities, because according to their own estimates, you would literally need to build thousands of them. How about don't pump the oil and gas out of the ground, leave the carbon there, and simple solution here, plant trees. Sounds simple, and it is, and it would work. The benefit is that growing trees is relatively cheap. It provides jobs, you can cut the trees down when you need them, and when you actually get that wood, you don't actually create any CO2 unless you burn it. It's a valuable resource, and it creates a natural habitat for creatures. It creates less stress for humans, all around a win-win. Okay, now this hippy-dippy kind of, you know, plant a tree and, and love is the answer kind of thing, if it worked, why wouldn't these guys be saying that? Why wouldn't they say, oh, you know what the cheap solution is? We're just going to plant a bunch of trees and then we can continue, uh, you know, polluting. Do they make any money doing that? Oh, I see. The, the carbon capture they get to actually produce oil with a subsidy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I mean, yeah. But I mean, like, okay. Are the trees really going to save us? Well, let's take a look. According to this study published in Yale Environment in February, ecologist Thomas Crother at Swiss University ETH Zurich estimates that if we planted 1.2 trillion trees, we could absorb 10 years of human carbon emissions. That's the world's human population over 10 years. Crowther said, there's 400 gigatons of carbon dioxide stored now in the three trillion trees. If you were to scale that up by another trillion trees, that's in the order of hundreds of gigatons captured from the atmosphere. At least 10 years of anthropogenic emissions completely wiped out. Three trillion trees, you're going to add another trillion tree. Where are you going to put all of these trees? You're increasing the trees by like... 25, 33%. Uh, they actually fit, the studies have shown that you can actually fit these trees in all the natural parks and abandoned lands that we already have. You don't have to kick people out of their houses. You don't have to plant them in weird places. We have the room for the trees. Okay, okay, great. So there's enough room to plant trees. That's gonna cost so much money. I mean, t t trillions of trees? Are you kidding me? Well, we partner with OneTreePlanted.org and we pay a dollar to plant a tree in places all over the world, from the Amazon to right here in the US. So if we paid a dollar a tree for 1.2 trillion trees, that's $1.2 trillion to f solve the 
problem. That's literally hundreds of times cheaper than this bull system that they've come up with yeah. to lie to us, to be like, oh, why don't you do this fancy system? It's got technology in it. You're going to like it. And again, yeah. we're not against technology, right? We need technology to enable us to stop burning fossil fuels in order to just drive around. And we need new technology to create renewable energy to get us off of burning coal, natural gas, and right. oil. We just need to switch to renewable energy, start planting some trees, and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Except that we have these people, these mob bosses they're all meeting why are they all meeting because we are, are actually starting to wake up we're actually exactly. starting to open our eyes exactly. four million people were protesting we're striking for right. a climate strike why do you think mob bosses meet they always meet in the movies right when the feds are about to to do something right. or a rival gang is about right. to do something they get together they hate each other but they get together in a room and they talk about some solution who they're going to kill what right. they're going to do this is why these bosses from the C the CEOs of the largest oil companies, they don't want to meet. Right. They're all in competition with each other. Exactly. They all got together because there's a big problem brewing, right. which is that the world is on to them. We are on to their stupid games. And so they have to come up with some kind of plan to make it look like we've got solutions for you. Calm down, everybody. Right. There's solutions. Don't march on us. We can, yeah. Don't worry, we want everything to be as orderly as possible. We don't want there to be a disruption because if there's disruption, they end up with no business, exactly. right? Because the biggest problem facing the world today is them. Exactly. They are the problem. And as soon as we realize that, as soon as we collectively get together with our governments and say, we're not gonna take it anymore. It's insane that we haven't done it already. And so that is what we need to do. We have to band together. We have to be mad. We have to be upset and we have to show it. And we, how do you show it? You contact your representative, you vote people into office that are going to do something and you make the switch yourself. You make that switch and you show everyone around you that you can do it. You switch to renewable energy. You switch to an electric car if you can afford one. You try and get as low carbon as possible and you show everyone in your life, this is what you can do. It's possible. I never thought that I could do this. When I was young, I electric cars, they were nowhere. Boom, along comes Tesla. You can have a car that does everything you need a car to do, plus autopilot and a million other amazing features. And suddenly I'm like, oh my God, I want one. Can I afford one? I don't know, electric cars are always so expensive. You can buy one for $35,000. People can actually afford that for a new car. This is the change that's happening, right? We have to show it in ourselves individually. If we passed laws that said we're not going to take another drop of fossil fuels out of the ground, we would immediately change our economy to a stable economy that's clean. It would happen. Industry would change because industry will react to whatever it has to react to. Right. As soon as you say you can't do this, industry will do that. We talk about it every week on the show. We show you that the answers are already viable. That it's already viable to have solar energy, wind energy, storage, electric cars. It's all there, it's all viable. If our governments tomorrow said that this is the way we're gonna do it, we would be doing it already. And you might be saying, oh my God, that's so much money, what are we going to do? Guess who has a lot of money? These f they have a lot of money. They have so much money. How did they get that money? From you. They got it from you because you had to give them the money so that you could put the gas in your car and then when it went up to $4 a gallon, you had to be like, oh, it went up to $4 a gallon? That's so expensive. And there was nothing you could do about it. Now there is something you can do about it. It would behoove them as a business to switch to it. As soon as we ban it, that's what they'll do. They'll yep. say, all right, well, we can't drill oil out of the ground. Good thing we have all of this money. I guess we're going to stay an energy company. We're just going to build a lot of solar. We're going to build a lot of wind. That's how we're going to solve this. Okay. You know, that's how businesses work. Yes. There might be people who lose their job. Yes. It's going to disrupt a lot of things, but guess what? We're going to come out of it as a stronger society, a stronger global society. They don't care. They don't care if they completely destroy society because they will be living in their bunkers and they will have paid their minions to look after them. It's us that we need to look after, our, each other. Yeah, I, I got nothing more to say. Nothing else to say. Have a good day.